All right, let's do this. RNAi lecture. So RNAi stands for RNA interference. So we're gonna talk about how you can build and design constructs that interfere with messenger RNAs in certain organisms. Okay, so RNAi is targeted knockdown of transcripts. So if you think of the central dogma, central dogma is DNA, oh my gosh, that's a fat pen, to RNA to protein. We should all know that really well by now, okay? And RNA, messenger RNA, is single-stranded. And RNA interference is when a particular transcript matches with a little sequence in that messenger RNA and forms what's called a RNA duplex. Okay, that means it's RNA bound to the complementary strand of RNA. And when that happens, the cell knows that this is not normal. The cell sort of sees double-stranded RNA. This is also called double-stranded DS RNA. The cell sees this and it knows that it's not normal. So it does a couple, it has a couple pathways that it goes through that causes some phenotypes which cause this original transcript to essentially be degraded. Okay, so that's the process. That's an overview of the process. Now let's talk about it more. So for a brief review, here is a good image of a eukaryotic transcript. Okay, so on the five prime end, there's a cap. On the three prime end in eukaryotes, we have what's called this poly A tail, which is a bunch of A's. Okay, it stabilizes the transcript in here is the coding region and usually this is where you're going to be targeting your complementary antisense RNA for RNAi. So in this scenario let's talk about the inputs. Okay there's a target and the target is going to be a transcript just like I said that originates from some ORF of DNA, but the target itself is RNA. That's input one. Second input. Second input is gonna be a little piece, okay, that is complementary to. It's got to match that target, okay? So there's a complementary RNA input. And by complementary, what does that mean? Complementary means it binds the target. And to bind the target, that means that it's an exact antisense variant of the RNA. Okay, so it's essentially matches the other strand of DNA perfectly. Those are the, these are the two inputs for RNAi. Okay, and I, within RNAi, there's some lingo that I just want to clarify. Uh, knock down versus knock out. Okay, when we say knock down, that we're usually using that in the context of RNAi. Okay. Knock down is when you still have the ORF. The organism that you're doing this RNAi technique in still has the ORF and it still has a complete functioning ORF of the gene that you're targeting. But the impact of you inputting this targeting complementary strand is that the transcript gets knocked down. So it's called a knockdown, not a knockout, because a knockout is when you actually delete that ORF in the DNA sequence. And it's literally then impossible for the organism to make RNA. 
So RAI is not a knockout, it's a knockdown, if that makes sense. And that can cause some problems because a knockout is completely 100% efficient. If you knock out a gene, you have no RNA left being produced in that organism from that gene because it's not there if you knock it out completely. Whereas in a knockdown, you're targeting the RNA from that or for degradation. And so sometimes some targets are less efficiently knocked down than others. So in RNAi, there's always an issue of how much, how efficiently is it knocked down, okay? So if you have, you see these graphs in RNAi techniques where you have a y-axis of copy number of transcript, okay? And these will usually be different treatments on the x-axis. And so if you see like a negative control, which is here's the standard amount right here, here's the standard amount of X transcript target. And with a knockdown, maybe you get about this much. But there's always a question when you use RNAi is, is this knockdown, you're knocking it down by this much, is that much enough to cause a particular phenotype that you wanna study? Is that sufficient for the conclusions that you wanna make Whereas if you were to actually do a deletion, the knockdown would be the entire region, right? Does that make sense? So there's always an issue in RNAi of is it being knocked down enough? And is that a sufficient technique to reach the conclusions that you draw with your study? But sometimes you don't need that. Sometimes this knockdown is just enough to get, say, an effect. Sometimes the effect that you're looking for is you just want to kill a particular insect. You're looking at, you're trying to do targeted control of a particular insect pest, and so you're targeting a key essential core gene, a conserved housekeeping gene, and if you knock that one down by 50%, the insect dies. And so then it would be that it's completely sufficient for what your purpose is, if your purpose is, say, to kill the organism. So RNAi has pluses and minuses, but just be aware that that's always an issue is how much is the transcript being knocked down? Mm, coffee. The key point here that relates back to the central dogma is that if you knock down a transcript by 50%, usually you're going to see a big reduction in the amount of protein that's translated from the remaining transcript. So if you get a 50% in RNA, you might also get a 50% reduction in the protein levels. And because the proteins are the things that do stuff, then maybe you'll see a 50% reduction in that protein's particular activity. That's a key point to relate it back to the central dogma. Okay, so a classic RNAi model was C. elegans. C. elegans is a nematode. And RNAi works really well in C. elegans. So a key point with RNAi, another key point, is that in some organisms this works, and in some organisms this doesn't. And you can imagine that, like C. elegans, okay, insects are somewhat related on the evolutionary tree. They both have an exoskeleton. They both have a cuticle that they shed, um, but. Insects themselves are very, very diverse. There's many different orders. They're broadly spread, spread on the evolutionary tree. So there's some insects that this is going to work on and some insects that this just doesn't work very well in. Okay, so just a basic point is that there are RNA model systems, some systems where this works really well and some systems where this doesn't work very well at all. And in insects, one of the best models for RNAi is the flower beetle. Tribolium, so that's right he here. So RNAi works well in Orthoptera, grasshoppers, Latidia, cockroaches, and Coleoptera, which is beetles. RNAi works really well in those. Hemipterans can be variable, variable, so a lot of what agricultural pests people are dealing with are hemipterans. These are bugs, true bugs, that stick their proboscis into the plant and suck the sap. RNAi is variable in those, so depends, it's going to depend on the pest, whether this is a good thing that will work or not. 
dipterans like mosquitoes and lepidopterans moths butterfly um it depends on the on the system that you're using but in general again you're going to get variable effectiveness with rnai depending on the system that you use there's also different systems of rnai itself but flower beetles are the best rnai insect model and there's lots of sort of trying to figure out mechanistic pathways on how this works in the flower beetle. So how does RNAi work? There's three main pathways of RNAi interference in an insect, okay? And these are these three right here, the SI RNA, MI RNA, and PI RNA, okay? SI RNA stands for small interfering mi rna stands for micro rna and pi rna is i think peewee rna i pathway <laughs> okay and these three systems, one, two, three, which we'll talk about some of these more in detail in the rest of the lecture, um, these are all defense mechanisms. So remember how we talked long ago about restriction enzymes and restriction enzymes were these enzymes that were found in bacteria and actually their actual job in bacteria was to cut up genomes of viruses to protect the bacteria from bacteriophages. And RNAi, the systems that correspond to RNAi are very similar in that they are defense mechanisms. So you can imagine, like I said in the beginning of the lecture, when the cell sees a double-stranded RNA, it knows that that's abnormal because it knows that RNA is typically single-stranded. So when it starts to see duplexed RNA, it thinks this is, what do you guys think this is? It thinks it's a virus because lots of viruses have double-stranded RNA genomes. Some of them have RNA genomes that duplex in funny ways. So when the cell sees strange RNA configurations, it thinks it's a virus and it has these defense mechanisms to try to get rid of that. So these three separate pathways are actually immunity pathways that protect the cells from viral invasion. And so they have these enzymes, okay, these special enzymes, which target these complexes and they have to get rid of them because they think it's a phage genome. They think it's a, uh, or I shouldn't say a phage genome, they think it's a virus genome and they have to get rid of them. So a lot of what they have are nucleases that are then gonna cut up and degrade these duplexed RNAs, okay? And so RNAi, the RNA interference technique, exploits this defense immunity pathway in eukaryotic cells, and it hacks it to use it to our advantage. Okay, so let's talk about the siRNA, small interfering RNA pathway. Okay, these pathways require you to have certain machinery. Okay, and by machinery, I mean machinery. I mean you need certain complexes of proteins for RNAi to work. And some cells maintain these immunity pathways, and some, I should say, and some insects maintain these immunity pathways and some insects do not maintain all these immunity pathways. But you need a complicated machine for RNAi to work. So back to what I was saying, this, this sort of machine that I drew out here, the circle that degrades this RNA, this is a protein complex of a couple different things. And this is a functioning machine and if you don't have all the parts of the machine, A, B, C, D, if you don't have all the subunits of the machine, the machine's not gonna function. So in some insects, when you say some RNA, in insects RNAi works well in some, but not in others, it's, and sometimes it's the case where they might have this machine broken down. Maybe they don't have 
the D subunit of the machine. And so the machine no longer works. Okay, that's what it sort of means to be for something to work well in an RNA pathway in a particular insect. They might have the complete assembled machine. And by that, what that really means is in their genome, they have ORFs that code for A, B, C, and D, all the subunits of that machine, which then by central dogma get transcribed and translated and go into the assembly of that particular machine. So the main point is that RNAi requires a protein complex, which is a complicated machine, okay? And that complex is given a name. It's usually called the risk complex. And, and there's also other proteins within this pathway that are important for this to work. So let's go over what they do. So the first step in the RNAi SI small interfering RNAi pathway is that the cell notices this double stranded RNA, like I said, okay? And it knows it's not normal. So it has these two enzymes, Dicer2 and R2D2, okay? You don't need to remember the names of these, although it's helpful for you to remember the name of Dicer because that comes up a lot in papers on RNAi. You'll see that a lot. So to just know that Dicer is a nuclease, okay? So that means by default, it cuts nucleic acids. And what Dicer does is it sees this double-stranded RNA product and it cuts it into little segments, okay? And these segments correspond over here to about 21 base pairs. So it cuts it into 21 base pair little segments. Then what happens next at step two is there's a complex called the risk complex, which is an assembly of many proteins. You don't need to know their names, but again, it's helpful for me to point out the nomenclature of things that you'll see. There's a protein called Argonaut. If you ever see Dicer or Argonaut, you know that people are talking about the RNAi pathway, usually, okay? So Argonaut is also, Argonaut is an RNA binding protein, okay? And the role of Argonaut, when it's complexed with the risk complex, that means these other subunits of the machine, when it's made together in the machine, the Argonaut protein grabs onto these little 21 base pair double-stranded RNA products that were made, created earlier by Dicer. It grabs onto them, okay? So that's what you're seeing right here. You're seeing this risk complex, Argonauts right here. It's grabbing onto the double-stranded RNA. And then what it does is it's able to remove that second strand of that little chunk of RNA. So now it cuts that second strand off. And now what you have is you've got a complex, okay, that's bound to now single-stranded RNA. And that has exposed bases that are looking to find hydrogen bonds. So what you've essentially created is a targeting mechanism. Okay, a targeting mechanism of this little piece of RNA that is now looking for a partner that matches it. And what does it match to? It's going to match whatever was originally double-stranded. So you can imagine if the cell is invaded by a virus, this risk complex has now created a heat-seeking nuclease that's going to target out that virus genome for degradation. Okay, if it's not a virus, if it's something that you provided, something right here, your double-stranded RNA that you provided, that where you chose the target, now the risk complex has been hacked to target, retarget back your thing that you picked in the genome. And so what it does is then it finds the RNA that is in the cell and it cuts it. So let me redraw out in my own words quickly um, this, this pathway. So you supply the cell or the cell is somehow finds itself in a situation where it sees double-stranded RNA. If this is RNAi in terms of the field, usually we are providing this as a target to sort of manipulate the pathway. But in nature, this would be encountered in an invasion by a virus, okay? Once that happens, there is a protein called Dicer 
and Dicer cuts this into little pieces, okay? And we said those pieces of double-stranded RNA were about 21 base pairs. Then what happens is there's a complex called the risk complex whose main constituent protein, which you want to remember, is argonaut, okay? When the risk complex finds one of these little pieces of double-stranded RNA, it cuts the end off the one strand, exposing the base pairs so that they're looking for hydrogen bonds. And whatever this thing matches is going to be now the target of this risk complex. And when it finds an RNA that it matches to, these things will bind, will bind to it. And now the risk complex has been coupled to its target, and then it cuts the target and degrades that messenger RNA message. That is how RNAi works in the small interfering RNAi pathway. Okay, the microRNA pathway. <clears throat> Now, this is a different pathway, and you'll notice if you look, the names of the complex proteins are a little bit different, but it still uses dicer, so it's dicer dependent. So remember when I said you kind of want to know the name dicer, because dicer sort of, uh, it, it comes across in multiple pathways of RNAi, and so does argonaut. So the microRNA pathway is very similar. It's still dependent on the dicer protein, and it's still dependent on the argonaut coupling in the risk complex. And the idea is exactly the same. The same, the thing that's happening here is exactly what I just explained, except there is a little bit different. There is a little bit of a difference. So let me, let me draw specifically what the difference is in the microRNA pathway. So how is the microRNA pathway different from the small interfering RNA pathway? Well, it comes in the input the input that the cell has received to stimulate this process. In the saRNA pathway, it's a double-stranded RNA molecule, okay? And this double-stranded RNA molecule gets cut into bits. But this is the key difference. The input is different, okay? Whereas in the microRNA process, microRNA I process, okay, the input, the double-stranded RNA, is not a double-stranded piece of RNA. It's a single-stranded piece of RNA with a hairpin, okay? So you note how RNA, because it's single-stranded, can complex with itself. And if the gene is somehow built in a way where the five prime end has complementary region to the three prime end, it can hairpin and bind to itself, okay? But this is still, the overall product of this is still a little sequence of what the cell would consider double-stranded RNA, okay? So this is treated the same in the cell, but by a slightly different pathway that's yet still dependent on Dicer and Argonaut. So what's Dicer gonna do? It's gonna find this, this hairpinned RNA. It's gonna cut it into its little segments, just like we've described before. And then the argonaut risk complex is going to find these little segments. It's going to cut off one of the ends, exposing those bases to now look for their hydrogen bonds. And once they find that target that it matches to, then the same product is going to get resulted. You're going to get degradation of that RNA product. But via a slightly different input, hairpinned RNA versus true double-stranded RNA. That's the difference between microRNA and siRNA pathways. Okay, there is a third pathway, the peewee RNA pathway. I'm not gonna talk about this too much because this is sort of a different mechanism, but I will point out some of the things um, that make this unique. The peewee pathway is a different cellular defense mechanism. The eukaryotic cell needs to defend itself from multiple things, not only just viruses, but it also has to defend itself from transposons. 
So if you recall, a transposon is a gene and that encodes for a transposase enzyme, okay? And that transpose enzyme can usually recognize sites at its, at its own ORF and it grabs its own ORF and cuts it out of the DNA and then it jumps with it and inserts it somewhere into the cell. It inserts it. And oftentimes this causes a problem. If the cell, if the transposase grabs its own gene and inserts itself into an ORF that is a conserved housekeeping gene, that cell or that organism might die. Okay, so the cell itself encodes defense mechanisms against which try to eliminate transposase activity. And the way that they can do this is once the transposase gets transcribed into messenger RNA, the cell has a pathway that can target that messenger RNA for degradation if it's a transposase. And the way that it does that is it builds in little micro RNA pathways or little RNA I pathways to target these transposons for knockdown to suppress transposon activity so that they're not creating problems wreaking havoc on the genome of the organism. And so the PeeWee interacting RNA pathway is a pathway of RNAi that's designed to knock down transposons. It's a cellular defense against transposons, transposon silencing, okay? And these still rely on argonaut, okay? There's argonaut homologs, what you would call, but they're different homologs. So in this one, it's argonaut one. In this pathway, it's argonaut three. So remember how I told you, you don't need to sort of remember all these different names. There's so many pathways in cell biology that like you can't remember them all. But when you start to sort of know the names of the key players, it's very helpful. So when you see argonaut or dicer, you know that this is something related to RNAi. All right, let's talk about transgenic RNAi. So, with respect to RNAi, a lot of what we've been talking about is the input. RNAi doesn't happen unless the cell encounters some form of double-stranded RNA. And I told you that double-stranded RNA is not normal in the cell. It doesn't usually see this. So we have to somehow supply these variants of double-stranded RNA. This is the input for RNAi. You have to supply double-stranded RNA. So there's varying ways to deliver these double-stranded molecules. And you can imagine one way is transgenic. And we could use either a hairpin or a double-stranded RNA strategy. So you could imagine you could insert a transgene that had a little sequence of homology to a target gene that you want to target for RNAi. And if we put a promoter going this way and a promoter going this way, okay, or we could even do, we could even have two sequences that are exactly the same. So this is sequence one going this way and this is sequence one also going this way. But we put a promoter going this way here and a promoter going this way here. We essentially have we're essentially making what we call sense and antisense RNA, okay? And the product of this would be that this would be transcribed and this would be transcribed. And since these were matching, they would find each other and form double-stranded RNA. Okay, so this is a common thing that you'll see in RNAi papers is they'll usually have a plasmid. They can have a plasmid where they're making both sense and antisense RNA, and that's all dependent on the direction of the promoter and how they're driving the promoter to make the sense and antisense RNA. But you see how that would work is this would be made, and then this would be made in the opposite direction, and then it would yield this double-stranded RNA. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to have one long gene, so one long ORF in a plasmid with a promoter on one side, but you make the ORF unique in a sense that you make 
This region of the ORF, the five prime region, the N terminal region of the ORF, you make it match in the opposite orientation, the three prime end of the ORF. And once this whole thing gets made, once this whole thing gets transcribed, if you make this region match this region, what's going to be produced is that hairpin. Okay. So you can do this, you can deliver and create transgenic RNAi systems by building systems which will yield a product of double-stranded RNA. And you can do that by either making sense and antisense RNA or generating some kind of a hairpin. And then these structures are going to be found by the dicer and risk complex in the cells and it's going to start turning on the RNAi pathway. And as long as whatever you're making your your target as long as whatever you're including in this sequence right here matches the target you want to knock down in terms of base pairs like if the base pairs match then you're going to yield a product that knocks down that rna transcript okay there is a phenomenon a unique phenomenon in some organisms which makes rnai particularly useful for insects which is called systemic RNAi. All of what we've been talking about so far has been RNAi systems that happen on an individual cell level. Okay, these happen inside an individual cell. But there are scenarios where you can get an entire organism, the whole insect, in every cell in that insect's body to turn on its RNAi system. And when that happens, you get a systemic knockdown of a transcript all over that organism. And that's usually how we are controlling insects with RNAi. We create systemic RNAi throughout the whole system. And we target a gene that's crucial for a particular pathway in that insect, knock it down, and then that results in the death of the organism. Usually the way that this happens is you can imagine one cell of an entire organism. So imagine you have an entire organism made up of multi cells, a multicellular organism. And in this cell, we successfully deliver some double stranded RNA. And that turns on the RNAi pathway in this cell. Sometimes what will happen is this cell might export some of that double stranded RNA that was cut up by the risk complex, those little 21 base pairs, it might export some of that into what's called the hemolymph of the insect. Okay, so the cells all bathe in the hemolymph, which sort of gives it nutrients. The hemolymph is a circulatory system of the insect, and some of these cells might pump out some of these little um, 21 base pair RNAi targeting double-stranded molecules to activate the risk complex throughout the entire organism. So you can imagine if the, if the insect is being invaded by a virus, it wants to turn on a systemic cellular immunity to that virus throughout the entire insect. It doesn't just want to suppress it in one cell. It wants it to suppress it in all of its cells. So it can do this by secreting these targets. And if these targets get into the hemolymph, they spread throughout the body of the insect, and some of these cells will uptake that double-stranded RNAi target, and then that will turn on the risk complex in multiple cells. So RNAi can become systemic in some insects if this pathway is able to happen. Okay, I have this graph to just show you an example of some of the controls that you will always see in RNAi, and this relates to the beginning of the lecture, where you're always gonna see these in papers with RNAi, where they have a figure, where there's a y-axis that is relative transcript levels, and if you add, say, the input RNA, so right here, the light gray and input RNA, you will usually see some form of knockdown. So in this case, so in this case, what you're seeing is here are two inputs of RNAi. This is a negative control, so it's not targeting anything relevant in this particular model, whatever it is. 
and here's the positive control that they're testing and you're seeing that this gene is knocked down by this much okay so I'm saying this is a common type of figure that you're gonna see in RNAi you don't need to know the details of this one in particular but you'll see this everywhere okay one of the main issues with RNAi for research is how is the double-stranded RNA delivered I told you that that's the input, either the double-stranded RNA or the hairpins. And so the question is, how do we deliver those double-stranded RNA molecules? So sometimes you can inject them. So they'll prepare these solutions and then they will literally take a little needle and inject it into the insect. Sometimes they can be stably fed to the insect. So they will feed them. Uh, put them in food and then they'll eat them and then that can possibly turn on the RNA pathway by feeding Sometimes they'll literally just take the insect and soak it in a bath of double-stranded RNA and that will just get sort of absorbed into the hemolymph A main point is that there are receptors on the outside of a cell Okay that recognize double-stranded RNA and they can import it. So a big point is that there are receptors on cell membranes that are looking for this stuff and if they find it they can import it and bring it into the cell to turn on these RNAi pathways. And the evolutionary function of that is this which I described earlier whereas they want to have cells to recognize this so that they can create this systemic immunity mechanism to defend themselves against viruses. And that's what we exploit to knock down, knock down genes in RNAi. Now some quick cell biology to just show you how complicated this process can be and some of the factors that you need to consider. When you're delivering double-stranded RNA to a cell and you're hoping that it will get absorbed and turn on a systemic RNAi response, a lot of times the fate of things that get absorbed into the cell is to go to the endosome or the lysosome and the lysosome's role is to degrade stuff. So if you end up in a scenario where your cells are, are absorbing this double-stranded RNA that you're trying to get to turn on an RNA pathway and it just goes to the lysosome and gets degraded, that ruins your experiment, okay? So a lot of times for these things to work, there needs to be a process by which when the cell sees the double-stranded RNA and absorbs it, it has some way of getting out, okay? It's gotta escape the fate of the endosomes. It's gotta escape the, it's gotta escape the fate of being delivered to that lysosome, which is gonna degrade it, right? And so a lot of times that's sort of a key research problem is how do we get it to escape the fate of the lysosome to make the RNAi more efficient? So as I've been hammering, RNAi is more or less efficient in many different systems. And you can now see all the different variables that play into the efficiency, okay? So here are just a small list. The double-stranded RNA itself might be unstable. So those little molecules or those hairpins, they themselves might be unstable. So if they themselves degrade, you're not going to get a good response. Double-stranded RNA internalization. These things might not get absorbed into cells very well. Maybe the receptor that grabs these is mutated, or maybe it's just not particularly active in a particular insect. If it's not being internalized into the cells, if it's not being absorbed and delivered into the cells, you're not going to get RNAi, unless it's transgenic RNAi and you've already sort of delivered it into the genome. Deficient core RNAi machinery. That means they might not have certain components of that risk or argonaut complexes, okay? They might not have certain homologs that are important for the pathway. They might have lost those through the series of evolutionary events that derive that species. So if they've lost those, you can bet that the RNAi system is gonna be impaired. Some systems might have good cellular RNAi, but they aren't good at systemically spreading the RNAi. And that could be a process due to export and import into the hemolymph of those double-stranded molecules. 
And you can imagine that you might just get unlucky and maybe the particular target gene that you targeted doesn't work very well. All of these factors can contribute to whether or not an RNAi system will work well or not. So now I just go into particular examples of those events that I've talked about. Instability of the double-stranded RNA. So this is where when we are delivering a piece that's either double-stranded or hairpinned, these things might degrade. What are some of the factors that contribute to that? Well, the cells themselves have molecules like RNAs3, which are RNases. They find RNA and they cut them up. And RNases are famously stable and they sort of just all organisms have them and they just kind of end up everywhere so rna is famously unstable because there's just enzymes that degrade it everywhere and it sort of just falls apart by nature because usually it's single stranded so double stranded rna should be a little bit more stable but because there's rnas is floating around sort of in the air well, i don't know about in the air but on the surfaces especially in guts and things like that of insects there's rnas is everywhere and so a big problem is if there's enzymes that are cutting up your targeting system, degrading it, then it's going to decrease your efficiency of RNAi. And these enzymes are famous for being in the guts of insects. So it's like, how are you going to feed double-stranded RNA to an insect and then expect that an RNAi system will get turned on when the guts roll on the insect is to degrade stuff like that to eat it for nutrients? Sometimes it doesn't work very well. But sometimes, crazily, it does, which is weird. Also remember that the pH of insect guts is, is usually acidic or basic, okay? And that is going to cause an impact on the stability of the double-stranded RNA if you're trying to feed it to the insect. So what could cause insufficient internalization? So this is where the cell might not actually absorb it. There might not be any receptors for this. They might be bad receptors as in they've had a mutation or they recognize something else. Or there might be no pores for the RNA. There might just literally be no homologs or orthologs of proteins that whose function is to sit in the membrane and import RNA. They might literally not be there. And if that's the scenario, you're not going to get good RNAi. How could core machinery differences impact? There could be presence or absence of particular subunits of this core complex. They might literally not be there. Also, even if they're there, they could have mutations in their promoters that cause different expression levels. So they might have very, very low expression of some particularly important subunit. That's going to mess up the complex and that's not going to make it work as well. Or they might, in some cases, they might have great expression, which is why it works really, really well in, in certain insects. Or they might have multiple copies. So Tribolium, which is the insect where it works really, really well, actually has extra copies of Argonaut and R2D2, which are the machines that sort of start the system off in the first place. So you might have more or less copies of, this, of the proteins that make up this protein complex. Okay, so just let me finish in summary. What you want to remember about RNAi is that one, the cell sees double-stranded RNA as abnormal. And it has ways to degrade double-stranded RNA. So a key part of RNAi is the delivery, is the delivery of double-stranded RNA. And we deliver that by either two mechanisms. We can make it transgenic as in we actually insert a sequence that's gonna code for a double-stranded RNA molecule, either by coding sense or antisense pieces that find each other and bind, or by encoding one long hairpin, which finds itself and sort of anneal, self anneals to itself. So we can deliver them by transgenic expression of double-stranded molecules of RNA in the cells, or we can actually deliver the molecules, as in like we synthesize them in the lab, we make them and we either inject them or feed them or bathe them in these molecules. And then we just hope that they sort of get into where they need to get. Okay. So the first part is we need to deliver this double-stranded RNA and the cell sees this double-stranded RNA as abnormal. The second part is 
Once it sees it, it activates the dicer and the risk complexes to degrade this double-stranded RNA into little pieces, okay? And these little pieces then form targeting molecules which find the transcript that it matches to and cause degradation or knock down. Remember, knock down, not knock out, knock down of a particular messenger RNA transcript. And I would say the third part that you want to remember, which I haven't talked about so much, but I, I thought it sort of was implied, is that this is a process that can be customized. And the way that you customize it is whatever you're targeting, whatever transcript you want to knock down. So let's say you want to knock down gene X. If you want to knock down gene X, then you have to take and build in a little sequence of homology to gene X into the thing that you're delivering. And then once you deliver that, that little homologous region of gene X in double-stranded RNA, it forms this complex which then targets your gene X and knocks it down. So it can be customized. And this is a great tool for agriculture because many agricultural companies are using it to knock down conserved genes, conserved functional proteins, and that causes death of the insect. Okay, so that's the end of the RNAi lecture.